In the 20th century, I thought I was a genius. I knew a lot of things, I read a lot of books, and I developed this trick. I would talk all the time and say as many things as I could. That's what geniuses do. It was really important to me to show everyone how smart I was. And it seemed to work out pretty well. I got 1550 on my SATs and I applied to a bunch of Ivy League schools. And I got into none of them because it turns out that even when you think you're a genius, you probably need to do your homework and I had a C minus average. So when I finally did get to college, I thought, I need a new approach. So I decided to focus on things that people thought were important and I would get to class and raise my hand and be the first one the professor would call on to talk about whatever book we were to be reading that day. And I would say a thing or two and then I wouldn't have to say anything for the rest of the class and it wouldn't look like I was trying to monopolize the conversation. And that seemed to be working pretty well until one of my professors said to me, you know, David, you could be really good if you actually read the books you talked about. So once again, it was time for a new approach. I did a lot more work and it paid off. I did get into an Ivy League university for graduate school. I moved to Silicon Valley and I joined startups. I had a bunch of cool tech jobs. Some of them were big companies. My family lives around the corner from here. We've had a pretty, pretty good life here. Work has been challenging, but you know, it has its ups and downs. In fact, in 2017, I spent the entire year looking for a job because my latest startup had let me go. That's how it goes with startups. And I was sitting in the driveway of my house and composing a text message when I suddenly realized I do not know where the letter L is on my keyboard, which, which really didn't make any sense because I knew where the letter L was on my keyboard and my arm felt a pretty funny. So I called my 21-year-old daughter Noah and I said, you know, I think we should go to urgent care, which we did. And I got there and they sat me down and they said, David, you're having a stroke. You need to get in the ambulance. So the ambulance drivers came up, these two hot looking buff paramedics, and so promptly I introduced them to my beautiful daughter Noah, and that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I knew, I was in the emergency room surrounded by a bunch of doctors. So I opened my mouth and I couldn't get any words out, none. They were right, I had had a stroke. And another thing, my arm and my leg, I couldn't find them, they felt, they didn't feel at all. It, it wasn't like they hurt, I just didn't know where they were. So I was in the ICU for about a week and then they sent me to rehab. And in rehab, they have some rules. One of the rules is never leave your bed without a nurse present. As you may have guessed, I'm not that good at following rules, so I did a lot of face planting. It turns out that if you don't know where your arm and leg are, you're gonna lose your balance and fall down a lot, and that really freaked out the nursing staff, who are just saints. The patience those people had with me was just amazing. And after two or three weeks of all kinds of therapy, I was ready to go home. So I put a walker in front of me and walked to the car. I was there for about a month at home and gradually did a whole bunch of different exercises. But I was really baffled. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink. In fact, I'm a pretty healthy guy. I went to the gym five, six times a week. My wife's a chef, right? So that's kind of a job requirement. All the things they said do not do, in case you might have a stroke, I did not do them. There were no signs, but I had a stroke anyway. Time went on, I got to about 
four months in, and I walked right past the school on the way to El Camino Hospital, where I had three different kinds of therapy. And the most intense was speech therapy. And what the speech therapist told me was, we don't think you have any real damage to your cognitive abilities. Look at this puzzle. How many sticks, matchsticks, does it take to make a cube? Well, I could do all those things. But there was one thing I could not do. I could walk the walk, but I could not talk. Now, I'm a high-tech marketing guy. Talking and writing is basically all I do at work. And suddenly, I couldn't talk. And I couldn't write. Me, Mr. Genius, Yale, startup. Now, I was Mr. Brain Damage. What the hell was I going to do? I sat down with a neurologist, and she said, you know, you have a hole in your brain about the size of your pinky. See, some blood vessels burst. And my dumb luck, in my brain, the blood vessels that affect speech were right next to the part of the brain that looks after how you get sensations, how you control your right side. Just a tough coincidence. Now what? So I understood that there was something wrong with my brain, but I couldn't, could I do anything about it? No. In fact, understanding what wasn't working in my brain really didn't help me understand what it is that I needed to do. Here's the thing about the functions in your brain and how they map to the functions in your body. Maybe you've seen this. This is called the neurological homunculus. It's kind of a sculptural representation of how the functions in your body occupy the amount of power your brain requires. And as you can see, you know, your hands and your mouth those take a lot of brain power. Isn't that kind of weird? Well, that's science. Scientists love brain damage because that's how they know what different parts of your brain do something. In fact, one of the most famous cases, this guy was actually, is actually buried here in San Francisco at Colma. Uh, well, everything but his skull. This guy, Phineas Gage, was uh, working on a uh, railroad construction site, and suddenly there was an explosion that drove a four-foot bar through his skull. And it went right through his skull, and so he got on a cart and rode to the doctor. And then he passed out. Well, he had a few deficits for a little while, but he mostly got back to normal. As you can see, he lost the sight in one eye, and this is where they learned in the beginning part of, in the middle part of the 19th century, what the different parts of the brain were responsible for. But understanding what doesn't work still didn't tell you how it worked. Now, I was really terrified of not being able to talk, and it turns out fear occupies a huge amount of your brain power, and there's a good reason for this. Imagine a bunch of humans on the Serengeti millions of years ago, and there were two groups. And one group says, look, here's some lions. They're sleeping, nothing to worry about. And the other group figured out that they ought to get out of there. Now, which of these two groups of humans do you think evolved to contribute to the gene pool that we all live in? Our brains are wired to respond to fear much more 
powerfully. About 150 years after Phineas Gage and the explosion that uh, helped scientists understand what happens when you subtract a part of the brain, this guy, Daniel Kahneman, won the Nobel Prize for an approach that he calls thinking fast and slow. And it explains a lot about how our brains really operate. It turns out that something called cognitive load, how hard your brain has to work, affects the way you draw conclusions and make decisions. When you have to do some math or uh, you know, some uh, uh, sophisticated equations or you kind of read or explain, you are loading your brain. There's one thing you might not remember. That's the lions. And so we are wired to respond to fear instead of doing all this deliberation to say, well, you know, the lions last Thursday, I'm thinking, you know, I saw this lion and the wind's blowing this other direction and uh, I think it's on Thursdays lions don't eat meat? Nope. Your mind has been trained to respond to fear and do just one thing, which is run. In fact, this is how I trained my mind. I was terribly afraid that people would not think I was smart. And so any smart thing that came out of my head, I would put it through my mouth in no time. And to make sure no one was misled, even for a minute, that I wasn't the smartest guy they'd ever seen, I just talked all the time. There's only one problem. The wires are now cut. I can't talk. And by this stupid coincidence, I can't write. And I still needed to find a job. I was out of work for a year before the stroke and then another eight months after the stroke. So I thought, maybe practice. So I talked to some of my friends just to kind of practice explaining myself to prospective employers. And I told them what the speech therapist had said, which is that I needed to talk more slowly. And they all said the same thing. They said, you know, David, you talk so fast two thirds of the time, we don't know what you're saying anyway. Really? I said, why didn't you tell me? Oh, they said, we did. Now that was a surprise. Or was it really a surprise? It turns out that the people who I was talking at were having exactly the same reaction as those people near the lions or me trying to talk, which is all that processing was not interesting to them. They just wanted to run. And if they were running and they were not listening, remind myself again, why was it so important to prove that I'm a genius? They're not listening anyway, so, so what do I do? Well, here was the answer. Since it was hard to talk anyway, all I had to do was stop. And the strangest thing happened. When I stopped talking, people wanted to talk to me. And something I'd long suspected turned out to be true. A lot of other people are also pretty smart. Some of them are even smarter than me. I didn't ever really want to think about that because I was so afraid that if I let them know I wasn't smart, that would be the end. So I would just keep talking. And now, because I could do nothing but stop, it changed what I thought my superpower was. I still had this terrible fear that people thought I was going to be stupid. But that fear, I couldn't use it to keep talking. There was only one thing I could do with those ideas, and that was to stop. That was my new superpower. Stop and listen. 
Now, it's been more than three years, and I've vanquished a lot of these challenges. I mean, after all, this is a TED Talk. Talk. But there are a couple of people who I still struggle with when I talk. One of them is my 16-year-old daughter. She could be watching this with you right now. Talking to a 16-year-old, let me tell you, as an adult, can be challenging. And there are no 16-year-olds who want to hear what a genius their father is. There's one other person, and that's my wife. We've been married for 30 years, which is more than half our lives. And there are a lot of strong feelings when you're in a relationship with someone that long with so many things going on. Those strong feelings, they translate into fear. And when you're afraid, you might, you might panic. You might want to run. But now I've learned to do something else. It's my new superpower. I stop and I listen. Thank you.